Hey guys, we all know that single-use beverage containers are not the most sustainable option, but we're not perfect. Sometimes we're traveling, we don't have our reusable container with us, or we're at the convenience store and we're presented with all these options, and we just want to know which is the best of the worst. If you're looking to buy a soda because your willpower is crumbling under that sweet allure of sugary carbonated water, then which one do you choose? Aluminum? Glass? Plastic? Well, let's find out. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Josh. Saving Green is a forum to help you save money and be more sustainable at the same time. So if content like this interests you, think about subscribing. So we know that beverage container waste is actually a huge problem. All this excess material shows up on our streets and our sidewalks and landfills and in our oceans. But we know all this. With over 400 consumable beverage containers per person per year in the US alone, it's a lot of trash. Now, a study from the Beverage Marketing Corporation in 2013 states that up to 78% of all beverages consumed are actually packaged in containers and cans like this versus in a retail fountain like at a restaurant, for example. So that's a lot. And basically the largest plastic polluters in the world are consistently Coca-Cola and PepsiCo for the last several years running. So the question now is, is aluminum a better option than plastic or glass for that matter? Well, aluminum certainly has some advantages. It's lightweight, it has a pretty high strength to weight ratio, it's plentiful, it's reusable, it's recyclable, but it's not perfect. So let's dive into the life cycle assessment of aluminum and aluminum can specifically and compare that to plastic and glass and see which comes out ahead. So to find the true cost of an aluminum can, both financially and environmentally, we have to look at the life cycle assessment and we got to start with production and harvesting and fabrication of the can itself. Now aluminum, raw aluminum, is made through the Bayer process using about 80 facilities worldwide and from there it gets fabricated at 1400 facilities in the US alone that employs about 156,000 people every year and produces about 53 billion dollars in revenue. It's a lot of aluminum that's made every year. Now about 26% of all the aluminum produced goes into containers like these aluminum cans and the rest of it goes to other industries like transportation, like aircraft and automobile manufacturing, construction, electrical, and machinery, for example. Now the primary method of extracting aluminum is from harvesting bauxite, which is a metallic mineral clay that's found mostly in Australia, South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Now, bauxite contains about 30 to 50% aluminum oxide, or alumina, which via electrolysis is separated into pure aluminum metal. And from there, it's purified using a lot of energy, about 156 megajoules per ton of bauxite. Now, a lot of people are rightfully concerned about bauxite waste. Now, after processing, bauxite produces a red waste product that's a this alkaline slushy clay that can be toxic because it contains levels of arsenic and radioactive materials. Now, estimates vary, but according to the IAA survey, about 162 square meters of land is needed for every thousand tons of bauxite that is produced. That translates to about 30 square kilometers every year of unusable toxic land. Now the aluminum industry supposedly repurposes and rehabs old mining sites so that the equal aliquots of land are compensated for every year. Whether that actually happens, I don't know, but if it does, that's a good thing. Now the EPA doesn't approve any repurposing of these waste products and therefore about two to two and a half tons of bauxite waste for every ton of aluminum produced is just basically discarded. The EU or the European Union does allow some bauxite to be used in building materials like brick but that's a very small percentage that's about three percent overall by mass. The rest of it is used in these dry packed cakes that is used in red velvet flavoring. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Now, other material inputs like other gaseous waste and other chemicals can be quantified and those are basically trace amounts, but I will link down to the life cycle analysis completed in 2010 for those details if you're curious. So what about carbon cost? Overall, the carbon cost, according to this article, puts overall raw or virgin aluminum at about 12 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminum. Now, the EU puts that figure slightly less at 11.09 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminum. And that figure is derived from the carbon needed for the alumina purification and the fluoride generation for electrolysis 
and the transportation and fossil fuel demand for all of these mechanical and chemical processes. Now here's a diagram of how those figures are divided. Now if we specifically look at can manufacturing, additional steps like coating the interior and fabrication of the mouthpiece render some excess waste and some material that is not perfectly recyclable by mass. And we'll get into that in just a second. So an extensive life cycle assessment from PE International completed in 2010 and updated in 2014 looks specifically at the environmental footprint of aluminum cans. Now they looked at the two-piece can design, which is the mouthpiece and the bottle, and found that the two ingots required used about 16.57 kilograms per thousand cans of which 13.04 is the final mass of the can. Now the mass is also a little higher due to inks, paint, and other materials required to design the final can. And there are additional requirements like 67 megajoules of thermal energy, 109 megajoules of electricity, and 76 kiloliters of water specifically required for can manufacturing itself. Now, some advancements in electrolysis technology and transitioning to renewable power sources do reduce the carbon footprint of aluminum manufacturing and can manufacturing as well. Now, aluminum.org states that advances in such techniques have reduced energy and greenhouse gas emissions by 17 and 42% respectively over the last few decades. And those numbers almost double when recycling is taken into account, but I'll get to recycling in just a second. Now furthermore, a global supplier of aluminum called Hydro has developed an efficient resorting protocol using hydropower that cuts the overall carbon footprint to about four kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminum. Now since most aluminum contains at least some recycled content, the Winnipeg Environmental Council rates aluminum at approximately eight kilograms of CO2 overall, with recycled content as low as two kilograms of CO2 per kilogram but an average virgin amount of about 11.89, which is similar to the other estimates previously discussed, like the ones from the European Union. Now also, improvements in can design have reduced the overall mass down to about 13 grams today from you know, 15 or 16 grams previously. Now fortunately, recycling aluminum does save up to 95% of the energy and carbon cost when compared to harvesting bauxite. However, those figures may be exaggerated and may be closer to about 70 or 80 percent from my analysis. Now, since it doesn't degrade in quality or strength, aluminum can be almost perpetually recycled, which is a really good thing. Now, doing so, according to Waste Management's website, will save about 10 cubic yards of landfill space every year per ton of aluminum cans. An additional 14,000 kilowatt hours of energy could be saved. And that translates to about $1,700 worth of electricity at about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, it could also save about almost 40 barrels of oil and about 15 tons of fresh water. Now, these figures put aluminum at significantly more cost and energy effective when recycled when compared to glass and plastic. And those specific values I will link down below to the waste management website if you want more information. So the question now is how much aluminum is actually recycled and how much of this can specifically is made of post-consumer content. Now, according to aluminum.org, again, maybe some bias there, up to 75% of all the aluminum ever refined has been recycled or repurposed dating back over 125 years. Now, and additionally, about 35% of all aluminum worldwide is made from recycled aluminum. So there is a real market for scrapping and repurposing aluminum unlike plastic. Now some estimates rate recycled aluminum at about $1,300 per ton versus $299 per ton for hard plastics like PET. Now the raw material cost of aluminum is about $1,850 per ton or just under $4 per pound of scrap aluminum. So that would equate to about a cost of about two and a half cents per can if this is 13 grams. Now compared to PET plastics at about 85 cents per pound of scrap, and that breaks down to about just under a penny per 25 gram, 16.9 ounce bottle. So per ounce plastic is definitely much cheaper to manufacture, but the difference shrinks when recycling is factored in. Now, since wholesale pricing is probably better for both materials, it's difficult to quantify, but I do think that plastic still probably pulls ahead from a cost standpoint. An article from Reuters estimates that about 68% of canned material is post-consumer content from a recycling rate of about 50 to 60%. Now that outpaces plastic of about 29% recycling rates on average. However, that same article also claims that aluminum at its most polluting 
can account for about 1,300 grams of CO2 per can compared to 330 grams of CO2 per 16.9 ounce or 500 ml bottle. Now, are those numbers accurate? Those numbers seem a little bit high for both materials. So let's dive into the figures a little bit more closely. If I run my own calculations based on the life cycle analyses that I previously cited, and I round out the averages of virgin aluminum at about 12 times per mass and recycled at about three times per mass, if we estimate about a 70% recycling rate, the average carbon footprint of aluminum made for these cans is about 5.88 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminum. And that point, the average carbon footprint of this particular can is about 88.2 grams of CO2. Now that figure is very close to the 85.6 per thousand can figure or 85.6 grams per can of CO2 when recycling is included in the LCA from that PE International study I mentioned earlier. So I think it's a pretty fair and maybe realistic number. Now the total global warming potential according to the CO2 equivalents when you include carbon monoxide and methane for example actually bumps that figure slightly to about 93 grams of CO2 per can. Now, aluminum, therefore, is not as carbon expensive as some critics claim, since the article estimates that a 500 milliliter bo plastic bottle, which is again 60.9 fluid ounces, produces about 82.8 grams of CO2. Now, this figure is also less than what Reuters had quoted about 330 grams. Now, since cans weigh a little bit less, 13 grams versus 25 grams, yes, there's more carbon per mass, but there's surprising parity between the two containers in terms of the carbon footprint. Now estimates vary for glass pretty broadly, between 0.4 and 8.5 grams of CO2 per ton of glass, with an average of about 4 grams per ton from what I could figure out. If you estimate a recycling rate for glass at about 25%, that puts an average 8 ounce glass bottle, about 227 grams, so this particular beer bottle is 202 grams, at just over 10 times the amount of polluting effect in carbon dioxide terms from the other materials quoted. Now to put these values into context, the EPA rates a gallon of gasoline at 8.8 .8 kilograms of CO2 per gallon. Now if you think of an average car getting 30 miles per gallon, the amount of carbon pollution in this can is about the equivalent of traveling 0.3 miles, so not a lot. However, if you consider the over 450 bottles or containers that an average American consumes every year, that's the equivalent of about a 150 mile road trip every year just in carbon waste. Now, manufacturing and recycling are only part of the story. To truly know the environmental impact of these beverages, we need to think about transportation and refrigeration costs as well. Now, a typical wood pallet, about 40 by 48 inches, can transport about 2,400 aluminum cans, uh, about 1,300 glass bottles, and about 1,700 plastic bottles. Now, if we normalize these values by fluid volume, the aluminum and plastic are actually very similar, but glass is a lot more inefficient because of the weight and thickness of the material. Now, fortunately, since all of these containers are basically chemically insulated, they don't need to be refrigerated for transport, which can save about 20% of fuel cost alone. Now, if you think about refrigeration, we have to consider specific heat of these materials or the thermal energy required to transmit through the material to achieve the desired temperature. And we see that in that situation, aluminum definitely comes out ahead, saving refrigeration costs on average by 50 to 77% according to this study. Now, if we add the greenhouse gas equivalents of this refrigeration cost, the aluminum can bumps up by 40 grams, the glass bottle bumps up by 79 grams, and the plastic bottle bumps up by 73. Now, interestingly, since beverages are often refrigerated twice, once the convenience store, and then again at your home fridge, those costs actually bumped up a little bit more. So where does that leave us? Well, I made a little table to kind of summarize all the important data points for the four major different types of beverage containers, 12 ounce aluminum can, 12 ounce glass bottle, a 16 ounce plastic or a 20 ounce plastic bottle made of PET, or a two liter plastic bottle made of PET. And I just looked online for different average costs. Some of them are gonna vary greatly based on if you're buying just one can or bottle versus in bulk of a pack of 12 or 24. But nonetheless, this is a general range of estimates. How much of these materials is post-consumer content? Again, the range for plastics is based on different averages and different studies. California, for example, is implementing a 15% post-consumer content mandate by 2022, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So I put that in there as just an average. And then average dollars per ounce in terms of cents, the net weight of each container, 
the CO2 footprint of the materials and manufacturing costs of each of the raw materials of the beverage container, and then including the CO2 footprint of transportation and refrigeration as well, again, based on that study from aluminum.org, and the average net CO2 per ounce, because that's really what matters. How much of the carbon footprint is associated with each ounce of the liquid inside? And we see that 11.5 is the value for the 12 ounce can, 83 is the average for the 12 ounce glass container, and the range of plastic bottles can be as low as 7.18 for a large two ounce container, or as high as 10.9 for 16.9 ounce bottle in this particular example. So here we kind of see that each of the highlighted values kind of represents the you know, leader in each respective category. And we see that plastic and aluminum kind of do split the differences uh, fairly well, whereas glass clearly comes up short, at least according to my particular analysis. So plastic actually comes out slightly ahead from an emission standpoint and actually from a cost standpoint as well. However, if we consider the reusability and recycling potential of aluminum, it may edge out the other materials, as recycling aluminum can be significantly more cost and energy effective overall than plastic and glass. Now, if you can, getting a two liter bottle may actually be the greenest option overall of all of these disposable containers, because at only 51 grams, it's actually the cheapest per ounce of volume of liquid. If you know you're not gonna be recycling, Maybe just get the plastic bottle and get the largest container that you can. If, however, you know you will be recycling, which I obviously encourage you to do, then I would go with aluminum. I would probably avoid glass in most situations because it just doesn't seem to be cost effective by weight. And also, unless you know you can repurpose the material yourself, it probably isn't worth it overall. Although some bottling facilities may be more efficient in their repurposing of the glass containers and it may not be broken down. So it really depends on your local area as far as glass recycling. So that's a quick review of the life cycle assessment of aluminum cans specifically, with some comparisons to plastic and glass as similar beverage material containers. Now, if we step back, aluminum C is certainly very compelling, but in actuality, plastic may be the greenest virgin material, but recycled aluminum is probably greener still. Since the market drives manufacturing and consumer behaviors, it's up to us as consumers to kind of know these numbers and make informed decisions. Now, personally, I think that if really one material was unequivocally cheaper and greener, I think that would really be all that we would see as options for consumers. But we can see that the industry really has normalized these pretty well, and both of these containers have their advantages and disadvantages. But I would say overall, if you're gonna be recycling, I would still lean towards aluminum. So this is a pretty complicated and controversial topic. So let me know your thoughts on this in the comments below. And again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. If you like this video or if content like this is helpful, please think about liking and subscribing to help the channel grow. And uh, otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Thanks again. Bye.